Our long-term friends, Pamela and Frank Arnosky, are true leaders in the locally grown cut flower farms. And it's always great to see Deborah Prinzig, founder of Slow Flowers. After visiting the Field to Vaz dinner tour at the Arnosky family farms near Blanco, CTG returned to get hands-on planting tips. One question we had, what are the best cut flowers to grow in winter? For direct seeding for the homeowner in the fall, of course, larkspur is, is a, a classic example, a great, great plant. The blue cornflower can be seeded in the fall. There's a really wonderful plant called nigella, right. which makes a beautiful blue, kind of sapphire blue flower with lacy foliage. It's closely related to larkspur, and it actually makes these really interesting swollen pods that are great for dried flowers later. They get kind of a balloon shape with these tentacles on them and uh, kind of a, a bluish tint on the purplish tint. It's a little short for cut flowers. Uh, the other things you could put out in the fall for direct seed are, are Queen Anne's Lace. There's a wonderful plant that I recommend for landscaping here called Orlia. And it's Orlia grandiflora. And it's a, it's like a, a short version of a Queen Anne's Lace with a, a very beautiful white flower. Larkspur and Delphinium are all classified as a species of Delphinium. Larkspur is an annual, technically Delphinium is a perennial, but here in Texas we grow them all as annuals. The other thing is Larkspur's seed is inexpensive, it's easy to germinate uh, in the field, and so we, we'll grow a lot of Larkspur direct seed. Delphinium seed is more finicky to start, and so it won't germinate until soil temperatures are very cool. It'll, it'll stay dormant. So it's very difficult to germinate outdoors here. Uh, it's much easier germinated in the greenhouse and transplanted. Corn flower, the agrostemma, the corn cockle, dianthus, those all go out in the fall every week, the same as we do in the summer. We try to extend our spring season a little bit by planting things sequentially during the fall. Uh, we'll plant larkspur early in November or late October. We'll plant it again in December, and I'll plant larkspur again in February. So even though we're just in the greenhouse for production in the winter, we're planting things in the field all winter long, anticipating production to start in late March for the field. Fragrant sweet peas are a sentimental favorite. What's their secret to success? Sweet peas, we start in November. If we started earlier and it gets warm, they just stall. So we, we've tried starting them earlier and they just struggle. So we wait until it's really nice and cool in the greenhouses. The Arnosky start many seeds in the greenhouse since grasshoppers and crickets can mow down tiny seedlings in the field. Even though home gardeners plant fall blooming perennials as long term residents, the Arnoskis treat them as annuals to make room for the next season's cut flowers. Salvia leucantha, uh, Salvia victoria, the Farinacea salvia, uh, the chrysanthemums, those are, those are things that bloom just in the fall. So we just start those in May, get them into the field in late May, early June, and then we run that cycle through just one time, and they're done in, in October. Um, as we go into the fall, and everything's coming out of the field, the greenhouse starts filling up with things like uh, centauria, um, delphinium, shasta daisies, things that will go out, uh, rudbeckias, things that go out and, and spend the winter in the field to bloom in early spring. So in August, I say, I'd say i say I'd start transitioning the greenhouse to growing plants for the winter, uh, winter months. But during the November to March, the winter, it's pretty dormant in the field. We go into the greenhouses with ranunculus and anemones and lilies for the winter. We have uh, 33 greenhouses, about an acre and a half under cover. The summer flowers have a different cycle than the, than the overwintering flowers. For instance, we'll plant larkspur or delphinium in, in November, and that'll bloom in April and May, and then they come out of the field and we immediately replace those with zinnias or marigolds or sunflowers. Once we get on the summer rotation, we are planting the same amount of every flower each week. We'll do 10,000 sunflowers or 5,000 marigolds or 5,000 zinnias or 10,000 celosias every week. So when do we plant seeds in the ground? Every seed is hardwired to germinate at its own proper conditions and temperatures. For instance, a lot of the plants like larkspur and cornflower and um, agrostemma and, and dianthus originate in southern Europe. And they originate to germinate in the fall when soil temperatures cool down. So that seed will sit in the ground all summer long. And if the temperature is too warm, it just stays dormant. It won't germinate until the temp soil temperatures go down and it wakes up and it knows that it's time to germinate because it's gonna germinate in the fall, grow a small plant, live through the winter, and bloom in the spring. The opposite of that are things like celosias and sunflowers, which will sit in the soil all winter long if it's too cold, and they won't germinate until the soil temperature is warm enough. 
And so we have learned from trial and error and from uh, studying as many manuals as I can what each seed needs. And some seeds need light to germinate. Very small seeds often fall to the surface of the soil and are only scratched in or, or not at all, they, and they germinate right on top. So they need light. Uh, they can actually sense light. There's a chemical in a seed that can sense whether it's getting sunlight or not. Opposite of that are some seeds, like delphinium, won't germinate unless they're buried. And they can sense the light, and they won't germinate if they're sitting on top of the ground. They're going to wait until something covers them up. Uh, every seed has its own requirement like that. Some seeds, like a zinnia, it doesn't matter. Zinnias will germinate anywhere under almost any temperatures or, or light conditions. What's the Arnosky's favorite trick for soil fertility? We compost everything back into the bed. All of the plant material that's left over after we cut the flowers is mowed, mulched down, and then tilled into the bed. So it's all worked right back into the bed. But we do have to bring in supplemental fertilizer every time we plant, because sometimes we'll crop a, a bed four times a year. So it's very intense production. Our, our basic fertilizer is um, cottonseed meal. We use cottonseed meal. Um, it brings in a kind of a, a natural rather than a chemical type of fertilizer. It runs about 6% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus and, and potassium as an average. It could change because cottonseed is a natural product. But it's a byproduct of the cotton industry. Um, it's sold for cattle feed and we can buy it from a local feed mill and use cottonseed. It's an excellent fertilizer for bringing your pH down. And here in, the, in central Texas we have high pH soils in the hill country because of the limestone. And our, our soil ranges from 7.6 to 8 in pH, which is very alkaline. And the cottonseed brings that, that pH down, buffers the soil. It's also a fairly long-term fertilizer. It doesn't disappear really quickly. It, it, it stays in the soil a long time, so we get a good residual nitrogen from that. In Texas, fall and late winter are often as hot as summer. How do the Aronofskis keep their cool? My uniform, so to speak, when I'm working in the sun is I wear a pair of loose-fitting khaki pants, a, usually a sleeveless t-shirt that's made out of cotton, and an overshirt that's loose and 100% and cotton also. And then I put on a hat and sunglasses if I need it. And we, often wear, we also wear a, a glove that has a nitrile, nitrile finger thing. Um, they're made by Atlas and they work phenomenally well. When you're in the, the, a bright sunny situation, you're actually a lot cooler if you're wearing long sleeves. And what I'll often do if I'm really hot out there is I would take my long sleeve shirt off, dip it into cold water, put it back on, and then you just get this evaporation uh, cooling, evaporative cooling that just cools us off and keeps us going, you know, nonstop. Also, I hate to itch and grasses and things like that. If I don't have on long pants, I get all itchy and crazy. Other people like Frank, Frank will work in shorts. I just can't do it. And a lot of the people will wear sunscreen, but I prefer to cover up before I have to use sunscreen because I, I want as much cover as I can before I have to start putting stuff all over my face. One major trick we have is first thing in the morning if you fill a quart jar up with water and dump a vitamin C packet, like an emergency packet in there. Vitamin C for some reason seems to really help us be able to withstand a lot of heat. We, we drink those little packets that have the vitamin C and the electrolytes in the mix. So you're kind of making like a little Gatorade that's high on vitamin C. And uh, those really help get through a full day of heat. If you'll start Just your making morning, sure that you keep yourself like that, yeah. hydrated and vitamin C and electrolytes. And, um, and we, we don't drink Gatorade or that kind of sport drink anymore. We used to keep those in the cooler, but there's so much sugar in them that we don't want to be eating that much sugar. Thank you, Pamela and Frank, for filling our vases and our garden of inspiration. Now let's check in with our friend, Daphne. Mm -hmm. 